actually had three moms. Weird, right? Well, okay, not exactly three moms, but my mom was a triplet. And my aunts were always in my life from my childhood. They came to every performance, every recital, every choir. My dad would be in the front row with the three triplets crying. So um, I always felt like I had three moms. And the Mars triplets, the famous Mars triplets, or should I say infamous, were born in beautiful downtown Brantford, Ontario. And a shout out to Brantford, anybody in the audience? And let me tell you, these girls were wild. They came from a, a loud Scottish family. There's a Scottish theme happening tonight. My, my great-grandparents uh, were from Glasgow as well. And um, they all grew up in London. And these girls all looked exactly alike. And they were starved for individual attention, I guess, because the second they turned 18, my Annie Betty dyed her hair bright red. My Annie Norma dyed her hair platinum blonde. And my mother, Margaret, the, the stable one, haha, -ha, was the lone brunette. And literally their whole life, they called each other Big Red, Old Yeller, and Rin Tin Tin. Seriously. <laughs> every, every Christmas card, every birthday card. But uh, my dad, on the other hand, was the complete opposite. He grew up in Paris, Ontario. He was an only child from a very upper crust, never a harsh word was spoken family in Paris. And he said that when he met my mom and started going to her house for dinner, he was like going to camp. And like any um, neighboring small towns, they had a rivalry between them. So apparently they used to say, Paris, flush your toilets, Brantford needs the water. <laughs> Crazy. <laughs> okay, but all, eventually all three triplets and their families moved to London, Ontario, where I was raised. And we used to have these huge family Christmases with all the aunts and uncles and cousins. And when I look back, I can kind of track a lot of my choices and directions and successes to those early crazy experiences with my wild family. We always had a huge turkey dinner with all the fixins. Still to this day, my favorite meal to prepare and eat. Just about to have one. And um, then we would have a talent show where everybody had to get up and do something, even the kids. They literally made you get up and perform. So my cousin, my youngest cousin and I would often do the nativity scene. We would safety pin towels to our backs and drape another one over our head, and then we'd swaddle one of my dolls into a makeshift manger, sometimes my cat, if he would co cooperate. And then we would duet this very pious, very serious version of Silent Night. And I'm sure it was very precocious, hilarious, but it was my start in show business. And after the talent show, we always had a game. So we did this big game. It was Our family called it Guggenheim. It was a, a parlor game with pen and paper and categories and letters. And I loved the game part of our Christmases. But I remember feeling as a child that I could never, ever win that game. Not ever. And I come from a very competitive family, so it was a little bit of a driving force in me. But one summer, I got invited to my best friend's cottage at the lake, and her family taught me another game called the Dictionary Game. And finally, here was a game I could win. For some reason, I was really good at making up phony definitions, and I had enough of a wordsmith thing from my mom, who was a writer and wrote plays and did a ton of crossword puzzles, that I could sometimes figure out the word origin, too. And so I brought that game back to my family, and suddenly I was the 12-year-old that brought my family a whole new game that they, I could actually win once in a while that they loved as well. And the dictionary game ultimately became the inspiration for Balderdash, which I invented in my early 20s. <laughs> Thank you so much! Yay! So Balderdash, um, it was, let's see, it was the, the mid-80s, so like the olden days for some of you people here. But um, we, uh, my boyfriend and I at the time, had a friend who had invested in another game that was sweeping the nation and kind of changing the whole game world forever called Trivial Pursuit. Maybe some of you have heard of that game too. And this guy was making an absolute pile of money as an investor. So my boyfriend and I said, well, why don't we make a game? But we literally knew nothing. We had no idea what to do or how difficult it was. And as a result, it actually wasn't that difficult. We kind of just began. A friend of ours did the box design, another did the board, and he and I just worked nonstop uh, researching words for the game. We literally spent night and day looking at hundreds of obscure dictionaries, and we actually got stuck and locked into the University of Toronto Library one night, but that's another whole story. <laughs> and um, we came up with 2,500 crazy words, and I remember them all weirdly. I have this weird memory, but none of them I can really use 
in, in a sentence. But let's say, like, there's a word haptodysphoria. Does anyone know what that means? No, I bet you don't. Well, it's actually an odd sensation felt by certain people when handling peaches or other fuzzy surfaces. <laughs> now, my really good friend in Los Angeles, her husband actually suffers from haptodysphoria. You can literally, I, could, I can chase this guy around the house with the little fuzzy cotton from the aspirin bottle. So, and what's another one? Um, this word, have you ever heard of the word yushabti? Probably not. The real definition is a small calfskin mummy placed in a pharaoh's tomb to do chores in the afterlife, which is, that sounds very helpful, right? <laughs> so, but the definition I remember was one from my uncle that wrote this lengthy definition, but it made us laugh. He said it was a, an, a Yushabdi is an African tribal custom whereby on the eve of her wedding, a bride-to-be can go from hut to hut and pick a, a gift of her choice. And then it said, and I think that's where the phrase originated, Yushabdi till you drop tea. <laughs> so of course this guy didn't want to win he just wanted to make each other laugh my father every every time we played balderdash which was many many times my dad would always at some point write the entrails of a bavarian chicken and we'd go dad we know it's you we didn't care anyway um we were kind of cocky in our youth too we which oddly worked in our favor um Believe it or not, one I remember that we walked out of our first distributor's offices because they said that they wanted the game, but it was going to take more than a year to launch. And we just thought, this is crazy. We, we, we want to do it sooner than that. We were very impatient. And we didn't understand that in any product, they usually takes at least a year in advance. But we just said that doesn't work for us. And we walked out of the meeting, out of the building, into the parking lot. I remember it was snowing, so it must have been like February or March. Anyway, the CEO followed us out to the parking lot and said, come back, come back, we'll make a deal with you. And they did. And they agreed to do a test market of 2,500 games and they got them out for Christmas 1985. And um, we did a bunch of press, we did a lot of crazy things. We actually, instead of a press release, we jerry-rigged 100 games with this little transistor laugh in a bag novelty, if any of you remember that. Do you remember that? So we, we um, put, figured out how to put them in there with a little micro switch and then put, carefully put the lid back on and then wrapped them up in gold wrapping paper with a big bow and my, all of our out of work actor friends delivered them to the people in the press with, in, dressed in thrift shop tuxedos and when they opened the game, the game laughed and we literally got every bit of press we, could, we asked for. We went across Canada. And it's a long, long story. But anyway, the games sold out by December 21st, 1985. And all the little mom and pop stores were taking orders. It was really cool. And it kind of like, we didn't plan on it, but it shorted the market and it got the word out and we got, it, it sort of, we were on our way. And um, so all those crazy words, my mother actually helped us with the words too. She, she ended up being known as Mrs. Balderdash and answered all the fan mail too. And, um, you know, when I think back on my life, my parents were always there supporting me. They, um, they were, my mom was always there. She was a stay-at-home mom. She was no Susie Homemaker, though, by her own admission. She said um, that she would do crossword puzzles all day, and she would. And then at 5 o'clock, she would spray a little pledge behind her ears, and my dad would think that she'd been doing housework all day. <laughs> That's good information if anybody wants to write that down. No. Whenever she got the vacuum cleaner out, my brother and I would say, who's coming over? <laughs> and then um, Monica actually said, when I was telling her the stories that my friend Monica said, you grew up in a house of jokes. And I really did. My parents were both amazing joke tellers, such a dying art, so funny. And my mom actually wrote a book about it, about their marriage, um, called I Married an Idiot. <laughs> Now, wait, before you think too badly about her, it, the, it was a self-deprecating title. The first line was Ian, my dad, always said he married an idiot. But she said they had the same breakfast for 25 years, piece of toast and a fight. <laughs> and sometimes no toast. And I'm thinking mostly no toast. But what they did give me was this sense of fun and play and music and laughter and kind of the freedom to, to be what I wanted to be. And I want to finish up with one of my mom's Scottish jokes, keep the Scottish theme going. So um, this is one of my faves of hers. Uh, there's an, uh, an anatomy professor at the Edinburgh University, and he says to his class, what part of the human anatomy swells to 20 times its original size when excited? 
and he looks around the class and no one's looking at him, no one's answering. He says, he singles out a woman and he says, Miss Ferguson, what's the answer then? And she says, I can't say, sir, I'm too embarrassed. He says, well, does anyone know the answer then? And this one teacher's pet in the back row puts his hand up and he says, I, Geordie, what's the answer, lad? And he says, the iris, sir. And he says, correct, lad. The iris of the human eye swells to 20 times its original size when excited. He says, now back to you, Miss Ferguson. There were three things wrong with your answer. Firstly, it's apparent you haven't done your studying and you don't know your anatomy. Secondly, you've got a dirty, dirty mind. And thirdly, I'm afraid you're in for a lifetime of disappointment. <laughs> Thank you so much. That's kind of my story. I am going to, um, gonna, uh, well, I wanted to say life's a game, but the good thing is that all of us get to decide how it's played. So that's the end of my speech. Thank you so much. <laughs>